Part three, chapter ten of A Raw Youth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Raw Youth by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Translated by Constance Garnett. Part three, chapter ten but again anticipating the course of events i find it is necessary to explain to the reader something of what is coming for the logical sequence of the story is obscured by such numerous incidents that otherwise it would be impossible to understand it that something is the deadly noose to which tatiana pavlovna let slip an allusion it appeared that Anna Andreyevna had ventured at last on the most audacious step that could be imagined in her position. She certainly had a will of her own. On the pretext of his health, the old prince had been in the nick of time carried off to Tsartsko Sielo, so that the news of his approaching marriage with Anna Andreyevna might not be spread abroad, but might for the time be stifled, so to say, in embryo. Yet the feeble old man with whom one could do anything else, would not on any consideration have consented to give up his idea and jilt Anna Andreyevna, who had made him an offer. On this subject he was a paragon of chivalry, so that he might sooner or later bestir himself and suddenly proceed to carry out his intentions with that irresistible force which is so very frequently met with in weak characters for they often have a line beyond which they cannot be driven moreover he fully recognized the delicacy of the position of anna andreyevna for whom he had an unbounded respect he was quite alive to the possibility of rumours of jibes of injurious gossip the only thing that checked him and kept him quiet for the time was that Katerina Nikolaevna had never once allowed herself to drop the faintest hint reflecting on Anna Andreyevna in his presence, or to raise the faintest objection to his intention of marrying her. On the contrary, she showed the greatest cordiality and every attention to her father's fiancée. In this way, Anna Andreyevna was placed in an extremely awkward position, perceiving, with her subtle feminine instinct, that she would wound all the old prince's tenderest feelings, and would arouse his distrust, and even perhaps his indignation, by the slightest criticism of Katerina Nikolaevna, whom he worshipped too, and now more than ever, just because she had so graciously and dutifully consented to his marriage. And so, for the present, the conflict was waged on that plain. The two rivals vied with one another in delicacy and patience, and as time went on, the prince did not know which of them to admire the most, and like all weak but tender-hearted people, he ended by being miserable and blaming himself for everything. His depression of spirits reached a morbid point, I was told. His nerves were thoroughly upset and instead of regaining health in Tsarsko, he was, so I was assured, on the point of taking to his bed. Here I may note in parenthesis what I only learnt long afterwards that Buring had bluntly proposed to Katerina Nikolaevna that they should take the old gentleman abroad, inducing him to go by some sort of strategy, letting people know privately, meanwhile, that he had gone out of his mind and obtaining a doctor's certificate to that effect abroad but katerina nikolaevna would not consent to that on any account so at least it was declared afterwards she seems to have rejected the project with indignation all this is only a rather roundabout rumour but i believe it and just when things had reached this apparently hopeless position anna andreyevna suddenly learnt through lambert that there was in existence a letter in which the daughter had consulted a lawyer about declaring her father insane her proud and revengeful mind was roused to the utmost recalling previous conversations with me and putting together many trifling circumstances she could not doubt the truth of it then inevitably 
the plan of a bold stroke matured in her resolute inflexible feminine heart that plan was to tell the prince all about it suddenly with no preliminaries or negotiations to frighten him to give him a shock to prove to him that what inevitably awaited him was the lunatic asylum and if he were perverse if he refused to believe and expressed indignation to show him his daughter's letter as though to say since there was once an intention of declaring him insane it might well be tried again in order to prevent his marriage then to take the frightened and shattered old man to petersburg straight to my lodging it was a terrible risk but she had complete confidence in her powers here i will digress for a moment to observe that the later course of events proved that she had not been mistaken as to the effect of this blow what is more the effect of it exceeded her expectations the news of the existence of this letter produced perhaps a far stronger effect on the old prince than she or any of us had anticipated i had no idea until then that the old prince had heard of this letter before but like all weak and timid people he did not believe the rumor and did his utmost to dismiss it from his mind in order to preserve his serenity what is more he reproached himself for his baseness in being ready to believe it i may add the fact that is the existence of the letter had a far greater effect on katerina nikolaevna than i had expected in fact this scrap of paper turned out to be of far greater consequence than i carrying it in my pocket had imagined but i am running too far ahead but why i shall be asked to my lodgings why convey the old prince to my pitiful little den and alarm him perhaps by the sordidness of his surroundings if not to his own home where all her plans might be thwarted at once why not to some sumptuous private apartments as lambert urged but it was just on this that anna andreyevna reckoned in her desperate step her chief object was to confront the prince with the document but nothing would have induced me to give it up and as there was no time to lose anna andreyevna relying on her power to carry off the position resolved to begin without the document bringing the old prince straight to me for what purpose to catch me by that same step so to say to kill two birds with one stone she reckoned on working upon me by the sudden blow the shock the unexpectedness of it she anticipated that when i found the old man in my room when i saw his helplessness and his alarm and heard them all imploring me i should give in and show the document i must confess her calculation was crafty and clever and showed psychological insight what is more she was very nearly successful as for the old man anna andreyevna had succeeded in bringing him away and had forced him to believe her simply by telling him that she was bringing him to me all this i learned later the mere statement that the letter was in my hands extinguished in his timid heart the last doubts of the fact so great were his love and respect for me i may remark too that anna andreyevna herself never for a moment doubted that i still had the letter and had not let it go out of my hands her great mistake was that she had a wrong conception of my character and was cynically reckoning on my innocence my good nature and even my sentimentality and on the other hand she imagined that even if i had made up my mind to give up the letter to katarina nikolaevna for instance i should only do so under special conditions and she made haste to anticipate those conditions by the suddenness the unexpectedness of her master-stroke and finally lambert confirmed her in all this i have mentioned already that lambert's position at this time was most critical the traitor would have liked above everything to lure me from anna andreyevna so that with him 
i might sell the letter to madame amakoff which he for some reason considered a more profitable course but since nothing would induce me to give up the document till the last moment he decided at any rate to act with anna andreevna also that he might not risk losing everything and therefore he did his utmost to force his services on her till the very last hour and i know that he even offered to procure a priest if necessary but anna andreevna had asked him with a contemptuous smile not to suggest this lambert struck her as horribly coarse and aroused her utmost aversion but to be on the safe side she still accepted his services as a spy for instance by the way i do not know for certain to this day whether they bought over pyotr ippolitovitch my landlord and whether he got anything at all from them for his services or whether he simply worked for them for the joy of intrigue but that he acted as a spy upon me and that his wife did also i know for a fact the reader will understand now that though i was to some extent forewarned yet i could not have guessed that the next day or the day after i should find the old prince in my lodgings and in such circumstances indeed i never could have conceived of such audacity from anna andreevna one may talk freely and hint at anything one likes but to decide to act and to carry things out well that really is character to continue i waked up late in the morning i slept an exceptionally sound and dreamless sleep as i remember with wonder so that i waked up next morning feeling unusually confident again as though nothing had happened the day before i intended not going first to mother's but straight to the church of the cemetery with the idea of returning to mother's after the ceremony and remaining the rest of the day i was firmly convinced that in any case i should meet him sooner or later at mother's neither alphonsine nor the landlord had been at the flat for a long time i would not on any account question the landlady and indeed i made up my mind to cut off all relations with them for the future and even to give up my lodgings as soon as i could and so as soon as my coffee had been brought i put the hook on the door again but suddenly there was a knock at the door and to my surprise it turned out to be tereshatov i opened the door at once and delighted to see him I asked him to come in but he refused i will only say two words from the door or perhaps i will come in for i fancy one must talk in a whisper here only i won't sit down you are looking at my horrid coat lambert took my greatcoat he was in fact wearing a wretched old greatcoat which did not fit him he stood before me without taking off his hat a gloomy dejected figure with his hands in his pockets i won't sit down i won't sit down listen dolgoruki i know nothing in detail but i know that lambert is preparing some treachery against you at once and you won't escape it and that's certain and so be careful i was told by that pockmarked fellow do you remember him but he did not tell me anything more about it so i can't tell you i've only come to warn you good-bye but sit down dear trishatov though i'm in a hurry i'm so glad to see you i cried i won't sit down i won't sit down but i shall remember you were glad to see me oh dolgoruki why deceive others i've consciously of my own free will consented to every sort of abomination to things so vile that i can't speak of them before you now we are at the pockmarked fellows good-bye i am not worthy to sit down with you nonsense trishatov dear no you see dolgoruki i keep a bold face before every one and i'm going to have a rollicking time i shall soon have a better fur coat than my old one and shall be driving a fast trotter but i shall know in my own mind that i did not sit down in your room because i judge myself unworthy 
because I'm low compared with you. It will always be nice for me to remember that when I'm in the midst of disgraceful debauchery. Goodbye. Goodbye, and I won't give you my hand. Why, Alphonsine won't take my hand. And please don't follow me or come to see me. That's a compact between us. The strange boy turned and went out. I had no time then, but I made up my mind to seek him out as soon as I had settled our affairs. I won't describe the rest of that morning, though there is a great deal that might be recalled. Versilov was not at the funeral service in the church, and I fancy from their faces I could have gathered that they did not expect him there. Mother prayed devoutly, and seemed entirely absorbed in the service. There were only Liza and Tatiana Pavlovna by the coffin. But I will describe nothing, nothing. After the burial, we all returned and sat down to a meal, and again I gathered by their faces that he was not expected to it. When we rose from the table, I went up to Mother, embraced her, and congratulated her on her birthday. Liza did the same after me. "'Listen, brother,' Liza whispered to me on the sly. "'They are expecting him.' "'I guessed so, Liza. I see it. "'He is certainly coming.' "'So they must have heard something positive,' I thought. "'But I didn't ask any question. "'Though I'm not going to describe my feelings, "'all this mystery began to weigh like a stone upon my heart again, "'in spite of my confident mood.' We all settled down in the drawing-room, near Mother, at the round table. Oh, how I liked being with her then, and looking at her. Mother suddenly asked me to read something out of the Gospel. I read a chapter from St. Luke. She did not weep, and was not even very sorrowful, but her face had never seemed to me so full of spiritual meaning. There was the light of thought in her gentle eyes, but I could not trace in them any sign that she expected something with apprehension. The conversation never flagged. We recalled many reminiscences of Makar Ivanovitch. Tatiana Pavlovna, too, told us many things about him, of which I had no idea before. And, in fact, it would make an interesting chapter if it were all written down. Even Tatiana Pavlovna wore quite a different air from usual. She was very gentle very affectionate, and, what is more, also very quiet, though she talked a good deal to distract Mother's mind. But one detail I remember well. Mother was sitting on the sofa, and on a special round table on her left there lay, apparently put there for some purpose, a plain antique icon, with halos on the heads of the saints, of which there were two. This icon had belonged to Makar Ivanovitch, I knew that, and knew also that the old man had never parted from it, and looked upon it with superstitious reverence. Tatiana Pavlovna glanced at it several times. "'Listen, Sophia,' she said, suddenly changing the conversation. "'Instead of the icons lying down, would it not be better to stand it up on the table against the wall, and to light the lamp before it?' No, better as it is, said Mother. I dare say you're right. It might seem making too much fuss. I did not understand at the time, but this icon had long ago been verbally bequeathed by Makar Ivanovitch to Andrei Petrovitch, and Mother was preparing to give it to him now. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. We were still talking when I noticed a sudden quiver in Mother's face. She drew herself up quickly and began listening, while Tatiana Pavlovna, who was speaking at the time, went on talking without noticing anything. I at once turned to the door, and an instant later saw Andrei Petrovitch in the doorway. He had come in by the back stairs, through the kitchen and the passage, and Mother was the only one of us who had heard his footsteps. Now I will describe the whole of the insane scene that followed word by word and gesture by gesture. It was brief. To begin with, 
I did not at the first glance, anyway, observe the slightest change in his face. He was dressed as always, that is, almost foppishly. In his hand was a small but expensive nosegay of fresh flowers. He went up and handed it to Mother with a smile. She was looking at him with frightened perplexity, but she took the nosegay, and a faint flush at once glowed on her pale cheeks, and there was a gleam of pleasure in her eyes. "'I knew you would take it like that, Sonia,' he said. As we all got up when he came in, he took Liza's easy chair, which was on the left of Mother, and sat down in it without noticing he was taking her seat. And so he was quite close to the little table on which the icon was lying. "'Good evening to you all. I felt I must bring you this nosegay on your birthday, Sonia, and so I did not go to the funeral, as I could not come to the grave with a nosegay, and you didn't expect me at the funeral, I know. The old man certainly won't be angry at these flowers, for he bequeathed us joy himself, didn't he? I believe he's here somewhere in the room. Mother looked at him strangely. Tatiana Pavlovna seemed to wince. Who's here in the room? she asked. Makar Ivanovitch. Never mind. You know that the man who is not entirely a believer in these marvels is always more prone to superstition. But I had better tell you about the nosegay. How I succeeded in bringing it, I don't know. Three times on the way I had a longing to throw it in the snow and trample on it. Mother shuddered. A terrible longing. You must have pity on me and my poor head, Sonia. I longed to because they are too beautiful. Is there any object in the world more beautiful than a flower? I carried it, with snow and frost all round. Our frost and flowers, such an incongruity. I wasn't thinking of that, though. I simply longed to crush it, because it was so lovely. Sonia, though I'm disappearing again now, I shall soon come back, for I believe I shall be afraid. If I am afraid... Who will heal me of my terrors? Where can I find an angel like Sonia? What is this icon you've got here? Ah, Makar Ivanovich's, I remember. It belonged to his family, his ancestors. He would never part from it. I know. I remember he left it to me. I quite remember. And I fancy it's an unorthodox one. Let me have a look at it. He took up the icon, carried it to the light, and looked at it intently, but, after holding it a few seconds only, laid it on the table before him. I was astonished, but all his strange speech was uttered so quickly that I had not time to reflect upon it. All I remember is that a sick feeling of dread began to clutch at my heart. Mother's alarm had passed into perplexity and compassion. She looked on him as someone, above all, to be pitied. It had sometimes happened in the past that he had talked almost as strangely as now. Liza, for some reason, became suddenly very pale, and strangely made a sign to me with a motion of her head towards him. But most frightened of all was Tatiana Pavlovna. "'What's the matter with you, Andrei Petrovitch, darling?' she inquired cautiously. I really don't know, Tatiana Pavlovna, dear, what's the matter with me. Don't be uneasy. I still remember that you are Tatiana Pavlovna, and that you are dear. But I've only come for a minute, though. I should like to say something nice to Sonia, and I keep trying to find the right word, though my heart is full of words, which I don't know how to utter. Yes, really, all such strange words, somehow. Do you know I feel as though I were split in two? He looked round at us all, with a terribly serious face, and with perfectly genuine candor. Yes, I am really split in two mentally, and I'm horribly afraid of it. It's just as though one's second self were standing beside one. One is sensible and rational oneself, 
that the other self is impelled to do something perfectly senseless and sometimes very funny and suddenly you notice that you are longing to do that amusing thing goodness knows why that is what you want to as it were against your will though you fight against it with all your might you want to i once knew a doctor who suddenly began whistling in church at his father's funeral i really was afraid to come to the funeral today because for some reason i was possessed by a firm conviction that i should begin to whistle or laugh in church like that unfortunate doctor who came to rather a bad end and i really don't know why but i've been haunted by the thought of that doctor all day i am so haunted by him that i can't shake him off do you know sonya here i've taken up the icon again he had picked it up and was turning it about in his hand and do you know i have a dreadful longing now this very second to smash it against the stove against this corner i am sure it would break into two halves neither more or less what was most striking was that he said this without the slightest trace of affectation or whimsical caprice he spoke quite simply but that made it all the more terrible and he seemed really frightened of something i noticed suddenly that his hands were trembling a little andrei petrovitch cried mother clasping her hands let the icon alone let it alone andrei petrovitch let it alone put it down cried tatiana pavlovna jumping up undress and go to bed arkady run for the doctor but but what a fuss you're making he said gently scrutinizing us all intently then he suddenly put both elbows on the table and leaned his head in his hands i'm scaring you but i tell you what my friends try to comfort me a little sit down again and all be calm if only for a minute sonya i did not come to talk of this at all i came to tell you something but it was quite different good-bye sonya i'm going off on my wanderings again as i have left you several times before but no doubt i shall come back to you again one day in that sense you are inevitable to whom should i come back when all is over believe sonya that i've come to you now as to an angel and not as to an enemy how could you be an enemy to me how could you be an enemy don't imagine that i came to break this icon for do you know sonya i am still longing to break it all the same when tatiana pavlovna had cried out let the icon alone she had snatched it out of his hands and was holding it in hers suddenly at his last word he jumped up impulsively snatched the icon in a flash from tatiana's hands and with a ferocious swing smashed it with all his might against the corner of the tiled stove the icon was broken into two pieces he turned to us and his pale face suddenly flushed red almost purple and every feature in his face quivered and worked don't take it for a symbol sonya it's not as makar's legacy i have broken it but only to break something and anyway i shall come back to you my last angel you may take it as a symbol though of course it must have been so and with sudden haste he went out of the room going again through the kitchen where he had left his fur coat and cap i won't attempt to describe what happened to mother in mortal terror she stood clasping her hands above her and she suddenly screamed after him andrei petrovitch come back if only to say good-bye dear he'll come sophia he'll come don't worry yourself tatiana shrieked trembling all over in a terrible rage a really brutal rage why you heard he promised to come back himself let him go and amuse himself for the last time the fool he's getting old and who'll nurse him when he's bedridden except you his old nurse why he tells you so himself he's not ashamed as for us liza was in a swoon 
i would have run after him but i rushed to mother i threw my arms round her and held her tight lucaria ran in with a glass of water for liza but mother soon came to herself she sank on the sofa hid her face in her hands and began crying but but you'd better run after him tatiana pavlovna shouted suddenly with all her might as though she had suddenly waked up go long go long overtake him don't leave him for a minute go long go along she pulled me forcibly away from mother oh i shall run myself arkasha oh run after him make haste mother cried suddenly too i ran off full speed through the kitchen and through the yard but there was no sign of him anywhere in the distance i saw black shadows in the darkness i ran after them and examined each passer-by carefully as i overtook them so i ran on to the crossroads people are not angry with the insane suddenly flashed through my mind but tatiana was wild with rage at him so he's not mad at all oh it seemed to me all the time that it was symbolic and that he was bent on putting an end to everything as he did to the icon and showing that to us to mother and all but that second self was unmistakably beside him too of that there could be no doubt he was nowhere to be found however and i could not run to him it was difficult to believe that he would have simply gone home suddenly an idea flashed upon me and i rushed off to anna andreyevna anna andreyevna had just returned and i was shown up at once i went in controlling myself as far as i could without sitting down i at once described to her the scene which had just taken place that is the second self i shall never forget the greedy but pitilessly composed and self-complacent curiosity with which she listened also standing and i shall never forgive her for it where is he perhaps you know i ended insistently tatiana pavlovna sent me to you yesterday i sent for you too yesterday yesterday he was at sarsko Sielo. he came to see me too and now she looked at her watch now it is seven o'clock so he's pretty sure to be at home i see that you know all about it so tell me tell me i cried i know a good deal but i don't know everything of course there's no reason to conceal it from you she scanned me with a strange glance smiling and as though deliberating yesterday morning in answer to her letter he made katerina nikolaevna a formal offer of marriage that's false i said opening my eyes wide the letter went through my hands i took it to her myself unopened this time he behaved chivalrously and concealed nothing from me anna andreyevna i can't understand it of course it's hard to understand it but it's like a gambler who stakes his last crown while he has a loaded pistol ready in his pocket that's what his offer amounts to it's ten to one she won't accept his offer but still he's reckoning on that tenth chance and i confess that's very curious i imagine though that it may be a case of frenzy that second self as you said so well just now and you laugh and am i really to believe that the letter was given through you why you are the fiance of her father spare me anna andreyevna he asked me to sacrifice my future to his happiness though he didn't really ask it it was all done rather silently i simply read it all in his eyes oh my goodness what will he do next why he went to konigsberg to ask your mother's leave to marry katerina nikolaevna's stepdaughter that's very like his pitching on me for his go-between and confidant yesterday she was rather pale but her calmness was only exaggerated sarcasm oh i forgave her much then as i began to grasp the position 
for a minute i pondered she waited in silence do you know i laughed suddenly you delivered the letter because there was not the slightest risk for you because there's no chance of a marriage but what of him of her too of course she will reject his offer and then what may not happen then where is he now anna andreevna i cried every minute is precious now any minute there may be trouble he is at home i have told you so in the letter to katerina nikolaevna which i delivered he asked her in any case to grant him an interview in his lodgings to-day at seven o'clock this evening she promised she's going to his lodging how can that be why not the lodging is daria onisimovna's they might very well meet there as her guests but she's afraid of him he may kill her anna andreevna only smiled in spite of the terror which i detected in her myself katerina nikolaevna has always from the first cherished a certain reverence and admiration for the nobility of andrei petrovitch's principles and the loftiness of his mind she is trusting herself to him this once so as to have done with him for ever in his letter he gave her the most solemn and chivalrous promise that she should have nothing to fear in short i don't remember the words of the letter but she trusted herself so to speak for the last time and so to speak responding with the same heroic feelings there may have been a sort of chivalrous rivalry on both sides but the second self the second self i exclaimed besides he's out of his mind yesterday when she gave her promise to grant him an interview katerina nikolaevna probably did not conceive of the possibility of that i suddenly turned and was rushing out to him to them of course but from the next room i ran back for a second but perhaps that is just what would suit you that he should kill her i cried and ran out of the house i was shaking all over as though in a fit but i went into the lodging quietly through the kitchen and asked in a whisper to see daria onisimovna she came out at once and fastened a gaze of intense curiosity upon me his honour he's not at home but in a rapid whisper i explained bluntly and exactly that i knew all about it from anna andreevna and that i had just come from her daria onisimovna where are they they are in the room where you sat the day before yesterday at the table daria onisimovna let me go in that's impossible not in there but in the next room daria onisimovna anna andreevna wishes it perhaps if she didn't wish it she wouldn't have told me herself they won't hear me she wishes it herself and if she doesn't wish it said daria onisimovna her eyes still riveted upon me daria onisimovna i remember your olia let me in her lips and chin suddenly began to quiver dear friend for olia's sake for the sake of your feeling don't desert anna andreevna my dear you won't desert her will you you won't desert her no i won't give me your solemn promise you won't rush out upon them and won't call out if i hide you in there i swear on my honour daria onisimovna she took me by my coat led me into a dark room next to the one where they were sitting guided me almost noiselessly over the soft carpet to the doorway stationed me at the curtain that hung over it and lifting the curtain a fraction of an inch showed me them both i remained she went away of course i remained i knew that i was eavesdropping spying on other people's secrets but i remained how could i help remaining with the thought of this second self in my mind why he had smashed the icon before my eyes 
they were sitting facing one another at the table at which we had yesterday drunk to his resurrection i got a good view of their faces she was wearing a simple black dress and was as beautiful and apparently calm as always he was speaking she was listening with intense and sympathetic attention perhaps there was some trace of timidity in her too he was terribly excited i had come in the middle of their conversation and so for some time i could make nothing of it i remember she suddenly asked and i was the cause no i was the cause he answered and you were only innocently guilty you know that there are the innocently guilty those are generally the most unpardonable crimes and they almost always bring their punishment he added laughing strangely and i actually thought for a moment that i had forgotten you and could laugh at my stupid passion but you know that what is he to me though that man you're going to marry yesterday i made you an offer forgive me for it it was absurd and yet i had no alternative but that what could i have done but that absurd thing i don't know as he said this he laughed hopelessly suddenly lifting his eyes to her till then he had looked away as he talked if i had been in her place i should have been frightened at that laugh i felt that he suddenly got up from his chair tell me how could you consent to come here he asked suddenly as though remembering the real point my invitation in my whole letter was absurd stay i can quite imagine how it came to pass that you consented to come but why did you come that's the question can you have come simply from fear i came to see you she said looking at him with timid caution both were silent for half a minute versilov sank back in his chair and in a voice soft but almost trembling and full of intense feeling began it's so terribly long since i've seen you katerina nikolaevna so long that i scarcely thought it possible i should ever be sitting beside you again as i now am looking into your face and listening to your voice for two years we've not seen each other for two years we've not talked i never thought to speak to you again but so be it what is past is past and what is will vanish like smoke to-morrow so be it i assent because there is no alternative again but don't let your coming be in vain he added suddenly almost imploringly since you have shown me this charity and have come don't let it be in vain answer me one question what question you know we shall never see each other again and what is it to you tell me the truth for once and answer me one question which sensible people never ask did you ever love me or was i mistaken she flushed crimson i did love you she brought out i expected she would say that oh always truthful always sincere always honest and now he went on i don't love you now and you are laughing no i laughed just now by accident because i knew you would ask and now and i smiled at that because when one guesses right one always does smile it seemed quite strange to me i had never seen her so much on her guard almost timid indeed and embarrassed his eyes devoured her i know that you don't love me and you don't love me at all perhaps not at all i don't love you she added firmly without smiling or flushing yes i did love you but not for long i very soon got over it i know i know you saw that it was not what you wanted but what do you want explain that once more have i ever explained that to you what do i want why i'm the most ordinary woman i'm a peaceful person i like 
I like cheerful people. Cheerful? You see, I don't know even how to talk to you. I believe that if you could have loved me less, I should have loved you then. She smiled timidly again. The most absolute sincerity was transparent in her answer, and was it possible she did not realize that her answer was the most final summing up of their relations, explaining everything? Oh, how well he must have understood that! But he looked at her and smiled strangely. Is boring a cheerful person? He went on questioning her. He ought not to trouble you at all, she answered with some haste. I'm marrying him simply because with him I shall be most at peace. My whole heart remains in my own keeping. They say that you have grown fond of society, of the fashionable world again. Not fond of it. I know that there is just the same disorderliness in good society as everywhere else, but the outer forms are still attractive, so that if one lives only to pass the time, one can do it better there than anywhere. I've often heard the word disorderliness of late. You used to be afraid of my disorderliness, too. Chains, ideas, and imbecilities. No, it was not quite that. What then, for God's sake, tell me all, frankly. Well, I'll tell you frankly, for I look on you as a man of great intellect. I always felt there was something ridiculous about you. When she had said this, she suddenly flushed crimson, as though she feared she had said something fearfully indiscreet. For what you have just said, I can forgive you a great deal, he commented strangely. I hadn't finished, she said hurriedly, still flushing. It's I who am ridiculous to talk to you like a fool. No, you are not ridiculous. You are only a depraved, worldly woman, he said, turning horribly white. I did not finish either, when I asked you why you had come. Would you like me to finish? There is a document, a letter in existence, and you are awfully afraid of it, because if that letter comes into your father's hands, he may curse you and cut you out of his will. You are afraid of that letter, and you've come for that letter, he brought out. He was shaking all over, and his teeth were almost chattering. She listened to him with a despondent and pained expression of face. I know that you can do all sorts of things to harm me, she said, as if warding off his words, but I have come not so much to persuade you not to persecute me as to see you yourself. I've been wanting to meet you very much for a long time. But I find you just the same as ever, she added suddenly, as though carried away by a special and striking thought, and even by some strange sudden emotion. Did you hope to see me different, after my letter about your depravity? Tell me, did you come here without any fear? I came because I once loved you. But do you know, I beg you not to threaten me, please, with anything. While we are now together, don't remind me of my evil thoughts and feelings. If you could talk to me of something else, I should be very glad. Let threats come afterwards, but it should be different now. I came really to see you for a minute and to hear you. Oh, well, if you can't help it, kill me straight off. Only don't threaten me and don't torture yourself before me, she concluded looking at him in strange expectation, as though she really thought he might kill her. He got up from his seat again, and looking at her with glowing eyes, said resolutely, "'While you are here, you will suffer not the slightest annoyance.' "'Oh, yes, your word of honor," she said, smiling. "'No, not only because I gave my word of honor in my letter, but because I want to think of you all night.' to torture yourself? I picture you in my mind whenever I'm alone. I do nothing but talk to you. I go into some squalid, dirty hole, and as a contrast, you appear to me at once. But you always laugh at me as you do now. He said this as though he were beside himself. I have never laughed at you, never, 
she exclaimed in a voice full of feeling and with a look of the greatest compassion in her face in coming here i tried my utmost to do it so that you should have no reason to be mortified she added suddenly i came here to tell you that i almost love you forgive me perhaps i used the wrong words she went on hurriedly he laughed how is it you cannot dissemble why is it you are such a simple creature why is it you're not like all the rest why how can you tell a man you are turning away that you almost love him it's only that i could not express myself she put in hurriedly i used the wrong words it's because i've always felt abashed and unable to talk to you from the first time i met you and if i used the wrong words saying that i almost love you in my thought it was almost so so that's why i said so though i love you with that well with that general love with which one loves every one and which one is never ashamed to own he listened in silence fixing his glowing eyes upon her i am offending you of course he went on as though beside himself this must really be what they call passion all i know is that in your presence i am done for in your absence too it's just the same whether you are there or not wherever you may be you are always before me i know too that i can hate you intensely more than i can love you but i've long given up thinking about anything now it's all the same to me i am only sorry i should love a woman like you his voice broke he went on as it were gasping for breath what is it to you you think it wild of me to talk like that he smiled a pale smile i believe if only that would charm you i would be ready to stand for thirty years like a post on one leg i see you are sorry for me your face says i would love you if i could but i can't yes never mind i've no pride i'm ready to take any charity from you like a beggar do you hear any a beggar has no pride she got up and went to him dear friend she said with inexpressible feeling in her face touching his shoulder with her hand i can't hear you talk like that i shall think of you all my life as someone most precious great-hearted as something most sacred of all that i respect and love andrei petrovitch understand what i say why it's not for nothing i've come here now dear friend dear to me then and now i shall never forget how deeply you stirred my mind when first we met let us part as friends and you will be for me the most earnest and dearest thought in my whole life let us part and then i will love you i will love you only let us part listen he brought out perfectly white grant me one charity more don't love me don't live with me let us never meet i will be your slave if you summon me and i will vanish at once if you don't want to see me or hear me only only don't marry any one it sent a pang to my heart to hear those words that naively humiliating entreaty was the more pitiful the more heart-rending for being so flagrant and impossible yes indeed he was asking charity could he imagine she would consent yet he had humbled himself to put it to the test he had tried entreating her this depth of spiritual degradation was insufferable to watch every feature in her face seemed suddenly distorted with pain but before she had time to utter a word he suddenly realized what he had done i will strangle you he said suddenly in a strange distorted voice unlike his own but she answered him strangely too and she too spoke in a different voice unlike her own if i granted you charity she said with sudden firmness you would punish me for it afterwards worse than you threaten me now for you would never forget that you stood before me as a beggar 
i can't listen to threats from you she added looking at him with indignation almost defiance threats from you you mean from such a beggar i was joking he said softly smiling i won't touch you don't be afraid go away and i'll do my utmost to send you that letter only go go i wrote you a stupid letter and you answered my stupid letter in kind by coming we are quits this is your way he pointed towards the door she was moving towards the room in which i was standing behind the curtain forgive me if you can she said stopping in the doorway what if we meet some day quite friends and recall this scene with laughter he said suddenly but his face was quivering all over like the face of a man in convulsions oh god grant we may she cried clasping her hands though she watched his face timidly as though trying to guess what he meant go along much sense we have the pair of us but you oh you are one of my own kind i wrote you a mad letter and you agreed to come to tell me that you almost love me yes we are possessed by the same madness be always as mad don't change and we shall meet as friends that i predict that i swear and then i shall certainly love you for i feel that even now the woman in her could not resist flinging those last words to him from the doorway she went out with noiseless haste i went into the kitchen and scarcely glancing at daria onisimovna who was waiting for me i went down the back staircase and across the yard into the street but i had only time to see her get into the sledge that was waiting for her at the steps i ran down the street end of part 3 chapter 10 recording by linda johnson part 3 chapter 11 of a raw youth this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a raw youth by fyodor dostoevsky translated by constance garnett part three chapter eleven i ran to lambert oh how i should have liked to give a show of logic to my behaviour and to find some trace of common sense in my actions that evening and all that night but even now when i can reflect on it all i am utterly unable to present my conduct in any clear and logical connection it was a case of feeling or rather a perfect chaos of feelings in the midst of which i was naturally bound to go astray it is true there was one dominant feeling which mastered me completely and overwhelmed all the others but need i confess to it especially as i am not certain i ran to lambert beside myself of course i positively scared alphonsine and him for the first minute i have always noticed that even the most profligate most degraded frenchmen are in their domestic life extremely given to a sort of bourgeois routine a sort of very prosaic daily ceremonial of life established once and forever lambert quickly realized however that something had happened and was delighted that i had come to him at last and that i was in his clutches he had been thinking of nothing else day and night oh how badly he needed me and behold now when he had lost all hope i had suddenly appeared of my own accord and in such a frantic state just the state which suited him lambert wine i cried let's drink let's have a jolly time alphonsine where's your guitar i won't describe the scene it's unnecessary we drank and i told him all about it everything he listened greedily i openly of my own accord suggested a plot a general flare-up to begin with we were by letter to ask katerina nikolaevna to come to us that's possible lambert assented gloating over every word i said 
secondly we must send a copy of the document in full that she might see at once that she was not being deceived that's right that's what we must do lambert agreed continually exchanging glances with alphonsine thirdly lambert must ask her to come writing as though he were an unknown person and had just arrived from moscow and i must bring versilov and we might have versilov too lambert assented not might but must i cried it's essential it's for his sake it's all being done i explained taking one sip after another from my glass we were all three drinking while i believe i really drank the whole bottle of champagne while they only made a show of drinking versilov and i will sit in the next room lambert would have to take the next room and suddenly when she had agreed to everything to paying the cash and to his other demands too for all women were abject creatures then versilov and i would come in and convict her of being abject and versilov seeing what a horrid woman she was would at once be cured and reject her with scorn only we ought to have boring too that he might see her put to shame no we don't want boring lambert observed we do we do i yelled again you don't know anything about it lambert for you are a fool on the contrary let it make a scandal in fashionable society it will be our revenge on fashionable society and upon her and let her be punished lambert she will give you an i o u i don't want money i don't care a damn for money but you can stoop to pick it up and stuff it in your pocket and my curse with it but i shall crush her yes yes lambert kept approving you are right there he kept exchanging glances with alphonsine lambert she has an awful reverence for versilov i saw that for certain just now i babbled to him it's a good thing you did peep and see it all i should never have thought that you would have made such a good spy and that you had so much sense he said this to flatter me that's a lie frenchman i'm not a spy but i have plenty of sense and do you know lambert she loves him really i went on making desperate efforts to express myself but she won't marry him because boring's an officer in the guards and versilov is only a noble-hearted man and a friend of humanity to their thinking a comic person and nothing else oh she understands his passion and gloats over it flirts is carried away by it but won't marry him she's a woman she's a serpent every woman is a serpent and every serpent is a woman he must be cured we must tear the scales off his eyes let him see what she is and be cured i will bring him to you lambert just so lambert kept repeating filling up my glass every minute he was in a perfect tremble of anxiety to avoid contradicting or offending me and to make me go on drinking it was so coarse and obvious that even at the time i could not help noticing it but nothing could have made me go away i kept drinking and talking and was desperately anxious to give full expression to what i was feeling when lambert brought in another bottle alphonsine was playing some spanish air on the guitar i was almost in tears lambert do you know everything i exclaimed with intense feeling that man must be saved for he's spellbound by sorcery if she were to marry him he would spurn her from him the day after the wedding for that does happen sometimes for such a wild outrageous love is like a fit like a deadly noose like an illness and as soon as it is gratified the scales fall from the eyes at once and the opposite feeling comes loathing and hatred the desire to strangle to crush do you know the story of avisage lambert have you read it no i don't remember a novel muttered lambert oh you know nothing lambert you're fearfully fearfully ignorant 
but i don't care a damn for that it's no matter oh he loves mother he kissed her portrait he'll spurn that woman next morning and come back to mother of himself but then it will be too late so we must save him now in the end i began crying bitterly but i still went on talking and drank a fearful quantity of champagne it was most characteristic of lambert that all that evening he did not once ask about the document where it was that i should show it should put it on the table what would have been more natural than to inquire about it since we were planning to take action another point we kept saying that we must do this that we certainly would do this but of the place the time and manner we did not say a word he only assented to all i said and kept looking at alphonsine that was all of course i was incapable of reflecting on that at the time but i remember it i ended by falling asleep on his sofa without undressing i slept a long time and waked up very late i remember that after waking i lay for a long time on the sofa as it were petrified trying to reflect and remember and pretending that i was still asleep but it appeared that lambert was not in the room he had gone out it was past nine o'clock the stove had been heated and was crackling exactly as it had done when i found myself the first time at lambert's after that night but alphonsine was behind the screen keeping guard on me i noticed it at once for she had twice peeped out and glanced at me but each time i shut my eyes and pretended to be asleep i did this because i was overwhelmed and wanted to think over my position i felt with horror all the ineptitude and loathsomeness of my confession to lambert my plotting with him the blunder i had made in running to him but thank god the letter was still in my keeping it was still sewn up in my side pocket i felt with my hand it was there so all i had to do was to get up and run away i need not care what lambert thought of me afterwards lambert was not worth it but i was ashamed of myself i was my own judge and my god what was there in my heart but there's no need to describe that hellish insufferable feeling and that consciousness of filth and vileness but yet i must confess it for i feel the time has come it must be recorded in my story so let it be known that i meant to shame her and planned to be almost a witness of her yielding to lambert's demands oh the baseness not for the sake of saving versiloff in his madness and bringing him back to mother but because perhaps because i was myself in love and jealous jealous of whom of boring of versiloff of any one she might look at or talk to at a ball while i should be standing in a corner ashamed of myself oh the hideousness of it in short i don't know of whom i was jealous on her account but all i felt and knew the evening before was that as certainly as twice two make four she was lost to me that that woman would spurn me and laugh at me for falseness and absurdity she was truthful and honest while i i was a spy using letters to threaten her all this i have kept hidden in my heart ever since but now the day has come and i make up my account but again for the last time perhaps fully half or perhaps even seventy-five per cent of what i am saying is a libel upon myself that night i hated her in a kind of delirium and afterwards like a drunken rowdy i have said already that it was a chaos of feelings and sensations in which i could distinguish nothing clearly myself but still i have had to confess it for though only a part of what i felt it was certainly present with an overpowering sense of disgust and a firm determination to cancel all that had happened i suddenly jumped up from the sofa but as i jumped up alphonsine instantly popped out 
I seized my overcoat and cap, and told her to tell Lambert that I had been raving the evening before, that I had slandered a woman, that I had been joking, and that Lambert must not dare come near me again. All this I expressed in a blundering fashion, talking hurriedly in French, and, of course, anything but clearly, but, to my surprise, Alphonsine understood everything perfectly, and what was most surprising of all, she seemed positively relieved at something. Oui, oui, she said approvingly. C'est une honte, une dame. Oh, vous êtes généreux, vous. Soyez tranquille. Je ferai voir raison à Lambert. So that I was even at that moment puzzled to explain the sudden change in her attitude, and consequently, I suppose, in Lambert's. I went away, however, saying nothing. All was in confusion within me, and I was hardly capable of reasoning. Oh, afterwards I could explain it all, but then it was too late. Oh, what a hellish plot it was! I will pause here and explain it beforehand, as otherwise it will be impossible for the reader to understand it. The fact was that at my very first interview with Lambert, when I was thawing in his lodging, I had muttered to him like a fool that the letter was sewn up in my pocket. Then I had suddenly fallen asleep for a time on the sofa in the corner, and Lambert had promptly felt my pocket and was convinced that there was a piece of paper sewn up in it. Several times afterwards he made sure that the paper was still there. When we were dining, for instance, at the Tatars, I remember that he several times put his arms round my waist on purpose. Grasping the importance of the letter, he made a separate plan of his own, of which I had no suspicion at all. I, like a fool, imagined all the time that he urged me to come home so persistently to get me to join his gang and to act only in concert with him. But, alas, he invited me with quite a different object. He wanted to make me dead drunk, and when I was stretched, snoring and unconscious, to rip open my pocket and take possession of the letter. This was precisely what he and Alphonsine had done that night. Alphonsine had unpicked the pocket, taking out the letter, her letter, the document I had brought from Moscow. They had taken a piece of plain notepaper the same size, put it in the pocket, and sewn it up again, as if nothing had happened, so that I might notice no difference. Alphonsine had sewn it up, and I, up to the very end, for another day and a half, still went on believing that I was in possession of the secret, and that Katerina Nikolaevna's fate was still in my hands. A last word. That theft of the letter was the cause of everything and of all the other disasters that followed. The last twenty-four hours of my story have come, and I am at the end. It was, I believe, about half-past ten, when, excited and, as far as I remember, strangely absent-minded, but with a firm determination in my heart, I dragged myself to my lodgings. I was not in a hurry. I knew how I was going to act. And scarcely had I stepped into the passage when I realized at once that a new calamity had occurred, and an extraordinary complication had arisen, the old prince had just been brought from Tsarsko Sielo and was in the flat. With him was Anna Andreevna. He had been put not in my room, but in the two rooms next to mine that had been occupied by my landlord and his wife. The day before, as it appeared, some changes and improvements had been made in the room, but only of the most superficial kind. The landlord and his wife had moved into the little room of the whimsical lodger marked with smallpox, whom I have mentioned already, and that individual had been temporarily banished I don't know where. I was met by the landlord, who at once whisked into my room. He looked less sure of his ground than he had done the evening before, but was in an unusual state of excitement, so to say, at the climax of the affair. 
i said nothing to him but moving aside into a corner and clutching my head in my hands i stood so for a moment he thought for the first moment that i was putting it on but at last his fortitude gave way and he could not help being scared can anything be wrong he muttered i've been waiting for you to ask he added seeing i did not answer whether you preferred that door to be opened so that you may have direct access to the prince's rooms instead of going by the passage he pointed to the door at the side always locked which led to the landlord's rooms now the old prince's apartments look here piotr ippolitovitch i turned to him with a stern air i humbly beg you to go to anna andreyevna and ask her to come here at once to discuss the situation have they been here long going on for an hour go and fetch her then he went and brought the strange reply that anna andreyevna and prince nikolay ivanitch were impatiently expecting me in the next room so anna andreyevna would not come i smoothed out my coat which was creased from sleeping in it that night brushed it washed combed my hair i did all this deliberately realizing how necessary it was to be careful and i went in to the old prince the prince was sitting on the sofa at a round table and anna andreyevna in another corner at another table covered with a cloth on which the landlady's samovar polished as it had never been before was boiling for tea i walked in with the same stern look on my face and the old man instantly noticed this and winced and the smile on his face was instantly replaced by a look of terror but i could not keep it up i instantly laughed and held out my hands to him the poor old fellow simply flung himself into my arms i realized unmistakably at once the condition of the man i had to deal with to begin with it was as clear as twice two make four that in the interval since i had seen him last they had turned the old man till lately almost hale and to some extent rational and not altogether without will-power into a sort of mummy a scared and mistrustful child i may add he quite knew why they had brought him here and everything had been done as i have explained already he was suddenly shocked crushed and overwhelmed by being told of his daughter's treachery and of a possible madhouse he had allowed himself to be carried off so scared that he hardly knew what he was doing he was told that i was in possession of the secret and that i had the proof that would establish the fact conclusively i may mention at once it was just that proof that would establish the fact which he dreaded more than anything in the world he was expecting me to go in to him with a sort of death sentence in my face and a document in my hand and was immensely delighted that i was ready meanwhile to laugh and chatter of other things while we were embracing he shed tears i must confess i shed a tear also i felt suddenly very sorry for him alphonsine's little lapdog broke into a bark as shrill as a bell and made dashes at me from the sofa he had not parted from this tiny dog since he had had it and even slept with it oh je de sais qu'il a de coeur he exclaimed indicating me to anna andreyevna but how much stronger you look prince how well and fresh and strong you look i observed alas it was just the opposite he looked like a mummy and i only said it to cheer him up n'est-ce pas n'est-ce pas he repeated joyfully oh i've regained my health wonderfully but drink your tea and if you'll give me a cup i'll drink some with you that's delightful let us drink the cup that cheers or how does it go that's in some poem anna andreyevna give him some tea il prend toujours par les sentiments 
give us some tea my dear anna andreyevna poured out the tea but suddenly turning to me began with extreme solemnity arkady makarovitch we both my benefactor prince nikolay ivanitch and i have taken refuge with you i consider that we have come to you to you alone and we both beg of you to shelter us remember that the whole fate of this saintly this noble and injured man is in your hands we await the decision and count upon the justice of your heart but she could not go on the old prince was reduced to terror and almost trembling with alarm après après n'est-ce pas cher ami he kept repeating holding out his hands to her i cannot express how disagreeably her outburst impressed me i made no response but a chilly and dignified bow then i sat down to the table and with undisguised intention began talking of other things of various trifles laughing and making jokes the old man was evidently grateful to me and was enthusiastically delighted but enthusiastic as his gaiety was it was evidently insincere and might any moment have been followed by absolute dejection that was clear from the first glance cher enfant i hear you've been ill ah pardon i hear you've been busy with spiritualism all this time i never thought of such a thing i said smiling no who was it told me about spiritualism it was your landlord here pyotr ippolitovitch anna andreyevna explained he's a very amusing man and knows a great many anecdotes shall i ask him in oui oui il est charmant he knows anecdotes but better send for him later we'll send for him and he'll tell us stories mais après only fancy they were laying the table just now and he said don't be uneasy it won't fly about we are not spiritualists is it possible that the tables fly about among the spiritualists i really don't know they say so they say they jump right off the ground mais c'est terrible c'est que tu dis he looked at me in alarm oh don't be uneasy of course that's nonsense that's what i say too nastasya stepanovna salomeyev you know her of course oh no you don't know her would you believe it she believes in spiritualism too and only fancy cher enfant he turned to anna andreyevna i said to her there are tables in the ministry of finance and eight pairs of clerks hands are lying on them writing all the while so why is it the tables don't dance there fancy if they suddenly all began dancing the revolt of the tables in the ministry of finance or popular education that's the last straw what charming things you say prince just as you always did i exclaimed trying to laugh as genuinely as possible n'est-ce pas je ne parle pas trop mais je dis bien i will bring pyotr ippolitovitch anna andreyevna said getting up there was a gleam of pleasure in her face she was relieved at seeing how affectionate i was with the old prince but she had hardly gone out when the old man's face changed instantly he looked hurriedly at the door glanced about him and stooping towards me from the sofa whispered to me in a frightened voice cher ami oh if i could see them both here together oh cher enfant prince don't distress yourself yes yes but we'll reconcile them n'est-ce pas it's a foolish petty quarrel between two most estimable women n'est-ce pas you are my only hope we'll set everything straight here and what a queer place this is he looked about him almost fearfully and that landlord you know he's got such a face tell me he's not dangerous the landlord 
oh no how could he be dangerous c'est ça so much the better il semble qu'il est bête ce gentil homme cher enfant for christ's sake don't tell anna andreevna that i'm afraid of everything here i praised everything from the first moment i praised the landlord too listen do you know the story of what happened to vincent do you remember well what of it rien rien de tout mais je suis libre ici n'est ce pas what do you think nothing could happen to me here of the same sort but i assure you dear prince upon my word mon ami mon enfant he exclaimed suddenly clasping his hands before him not seeking to disguise his alarm if you really have something some document in fact if you have something to say to me don't say it for god's sake don't say anything at all put it off as long as you can he was on the point of throwing himself in my arms tears were flowing down his face i cannot describe how it made my heart ache the poor old man was like a pitiful frightened child stolen from his home by gypsies and carried away to live with strangers but we were not allowed to embrace the door opened and anna andreevna walked in not with the landlord but with her brother the camera junker this new surprise petrified me i got up and was making for the door arkady makarovitch allow me to introduce you anna andreevna said aloud so that i was compelled to stop i know your brother too well already i rapped out laying special emphasis on the word too ah that was a terrible blunder and i'm so sorry dear and andrei makarovitch the young man began lisping coming up to me with an extraordinarily free and easy air and seizing my hand which i was incapable of withdrawing it was all the fault of my stepan he announced you so stupidly that i mistook you for someone else that was in moscow he explained to his sister afterwards i did everything i could to look you up and explain but i was ill ask her cher france nous devons être amis même par droit de naissance and the impudent young man had the effrontery to put his arm round my shoulder which was the height of familiarity i drew back but overcome by embarrassment preferred to beat a hasty retreat without saying a word going back to my room i sat down on my bed in uncertainty and agitation i felt suffocated by the atmosphere of intrigue but i could not deal anna andreevna such a direct and crushing blow i suddenly felt that she too was dear to me and that her position was an awful one as i had expected she came into my room herself leaving the prince with her brother who immediately began telling him some society scandal as fresh as hot cakes which at once distracted the impressionable old man's attention and cheered him up i got up from the bed in silence with a look of inquiry i have told you everything arkady makarovitch she began directly our fate is in your hands but i told you beforehand that i cannot the most sacred duties prevent me doing what you desire yes is that your answer well let me perish but what of the old prince what do you expect why he'll be out of his mind by the evening no he'll go out of his mind if i show him the letter in which his daughter writes to a lawyer about certifying him insane i cried with heat that's what would be too much for him do you know he won't believe that letter he's told me so already i lied saying he had said this of the letter but it was effective he has said so already i thought so in that case i'm lost he's been crying already and asking to go home tell me what's your plan exactly i asked insistently 
she flushed from exasperated haughtiness so to speak but she controlled herself with that letter of his daughter's in our hands we are justified in the eyes of the world i should send it at once to prince v and to boris mihalovitch pelischev the friends of his childhood both persons highly respected and influential in society and i know that some years ago they were indignant with the conduct of his greedy and merciless daughter they will of course reconcile him with his daughter at my request i shall insist on it myself but the position of affairs will be completely changed and my relations too the fanariatovs will i judge make up their minds to support my rights but what weighs most with me is his happiness i want him to understand and appreciate who is really devoted to him of course i've always reckoned most on your influence with him arkady makarovitch you are so fond of him and who does care for him except you and me he has done nothing but talk about you these last few days he was pining for you his young friend i need not say that for the rest of my life my gratitude will be unmeasured she was actually promising me a reward money perhaps i interrupted her sharply whatever you say i cannot i brought out with an air of immovable determination i can only repay you with equal frankness and explain my final decision i shall at the earliest possible moment put this fatal letter into katerina nikolaevna's hands but only on condition that all that has happened shall not be made a scandal and that she gives me her word beforehand that she will not interfere with your happiness that's all that i can do that's impossible she said flushing all over the mere idea that katerina nikolaevna would spare her roused her to indignation i shall not change anna andreevna perhaps you will change you had better apply to lambert arkady makarovitch you don't know what misery may come from your obstinacy she said with grim exasperation misery will follow that's true my head is going round i've had enough of you i've made up my mind and that's the end of it only i beg you for god's sake don't bring your brother in to me but he is very anxious to make up for there is nothing to make up for i don't want it i don't wish for it i don't wish for it i exclaimed clutching my head oh perhaps i treated her too disdainfully then tell me though where will the prince sleep to-night surely not here he will stay the night here in your flat and with you i am moving into another lodging this evening and uttering these ruthless words i seized my cap and began putting on my greatcoat anna andreevna watched me in sullen silence i felt sorry for her oh i felt sorry for that proud girl but i rushed out of the flat without leaving her one word of hope i will try to be brief my decision was taken beyond recall and i went straight to tatiana pavlovna alas a great calamity might have been averted if i had only found her at home but as though of design i was pursued by ill luck all that day i went of course to my mother's in the first place to see her and secondly because i reckoned certainly on meeting tatiana pavlovna there but she was not there either she had only just gone away while mother was lying down ill and liza was left alone with her liza begged me not to go in and not to wake mother she has not slept all night she's so worried thank god she has fallen asleep at last i embraced liza and said two or three words to her telling her i had made an immense and momentous resolution and should carry it out at once she listened without particular surprise as though to the usual thing oh they had all grown used by then to my constantly repeated final resolutions and the feeble cancelling of them afterwards but this time this time it would be a different matter 
I went to the eating house on the canal side and sat down there to wait a while in the certainty of finding Tatiana Pavlovna afterwards. I must explain, though, why I found it so necessary to see that lady. The fact is that I wanted to send her at once to Katerina Nikolaevna to ask her to come back with her, meaning in Tatiana Pavlovna's presence to return the letter, explaining everything once for all. In short, I wanted nothing but what was fitting. I wanted to put myself right once and for all. At the same time, I was quite determined to put in a few words on behalf of Anna Andreevna, and, if possible, to take Katerina Nikolaevna, together with Tatiana Pavlovna, by way of a witness, back with me to see the prince, there to reconcile the hostile ladies, to bring the old prince back to life, and, and, in fact, in that little group anyway, to make everyone happy on the spot, that very day, so that there would be none left unhappy but Versilov and mother. I could have no doubt of my success. From gratitude for my restoration of the letter, from which I should ask nothing of her in return, Katerina Nikolaevna would not have refused me such a request. Alas, I still imagined I was in possession of the document. Oh, what a stupid and ignominious position I was in, though without suspecting it. It was getting quite dark, about four o'clock, when I called at Tatiana Pavlovna's again. Maria answered gruffly that she had not come in. I remember very well now the strange look Maria gave me from under her brows, but of course it did not strike me at the time. I was suddenly stung by another idea. As I went down the stairs, from Tatiana Pavlovna's, vexed and somewhat dejected, I thought of the poor old prince who had held out his hands to me that morning, and I suddenly reproached myself bitterly for having deserted him, perhaps, indeed, from feeling personally aggrieved. I began uneasily imagining that something really very bad might have happened in my absence, and hurriedly went home. At home, however, all that had been happening was this. When Anna Andreevna had gone out of my room in a rage that morning, she had not yet lost heart. I must mention that she had already that morning sent to Lambert. Then she sent to him again, and as Lambert appeared to be still absent from home, she finally dispatched her brother to look for him. In face of my opposition, the poor girl was resting her last hopes on Lambert and his influence on me. She expected him with impatience, and only wondered that, after hovering round her and never leaving her side till that day, he should now have suddenly deserted her and vanished. Alas, she could not possibly have imagined that Lambert, being now in possession of the document, had made entirely different plans, and so, of course, was keeping out of the way and hiding from her on purpose. And so, in her anxiety and growing uneasiness, Anna Andreevna was scarcely capable of entertaining the old man. His uneasiness was growing to threatening proportions. He kept asking strange and timorous questions. He began looking suspiciously at her, and several times fell to weeping. Young Versilov did not stay long. After he had gone, Anna Andreevna was reduced to bringing in Pyotr Ippolitovich, on whom she was relying. He did not please the old prince at all, and even aroused his aversion. In fact, the old prince, for some reason, regarded Pyotr Ippolitovich with increasing distrust and suspicion. As ill luck would have it, the landlord launched again into a disquisition on spiritualism and described all sorts of tricks, which he said he had seen himself at seances. He declared that one medium had before the whole audience cut off people's heads, so that blood flowed, and every one saw it, and afterwards put them back on their necks, and that they grew on again, also in the sight of the whole audience, and all this happened in the year 1859. The old prince was so frightened, and at the same time, for some reason, was so indignant, that Anna Andreevna was obliged to get rid of the storyteller promptly. 
fortunately dinner arrived ordered expressly the evening before from somewhere near through lambert and alphonsine from a remarkable french cook who was out of a place and wanted to find a situation in a nobleman's family or a club the dinner and the champagne that accompanied it greatly cheered the old prince he ate a great deal and was very jocose after dinner he felt heavy and drowsy of course and as he always took a nap after dinner anna andreyevna made up a bed for him he kept kissing her hand as he fell asleep and declaring that she was his paradise his hope his houri his golden flower in fact he dropped into the most oriental expressions at last he fell asleep and it was just then i came back anna andreyevna came in to me hurriedly clasped her hands before me and said that not for her own sake but for the prince's she besought me not to go away but to go in to him as soon as he waked up he will be lost without you he will have a nervous attack i'm afraid he may break down before night she added that she herself would be compelled to be away possibly for a couple of hours and so she would be leaving the prince in my sole charge i promised her warmly that i would remain till the evening and that when the prince waked up i would do my very best to entertain him and i will do my duty she declared with energy she went out i may add anticipating events that she went out to look for lambert herself this was her last hope she also went to her brothers and to her relations the fanariatovs it may well be understood what her state of mind must have been when she returned the old prince waked up about an hour after her departure i heard him groan through the wall and at once ran into him i found him sitting on the bed in his dressing-gown but so terrified by his isolation the light of the solitary lamp and the strange room that when i went in he started jumped up and screamed i flew up to him and when he recognized me he began embracing me with tears of joy i was told that you had moved into another lodging that you had taken fright and run away who can have told you that who could you see i may have imagined it myself or someone may have told me only fancy i've just had a dream an old man with a beard came in carrying an icon an icon broken in two and all at once he said so shall your life be broken in two good heavens you must have heard from someone that versilov broke an icon in two yesterday n'est-ce pas i heard so i heard so i heard from daria onisimovna yesterday morning she brought my trunk here and the dog and so you dreamed of it yes i suppose so and that old man kept shaking his finger at me where is anna andreyevna she'll be back directly where from has she gone away too he exclaimed piteously no no she'll be here directly and she asked me to stay with you oui and so our andrei petrovitch has gone off his head so rapidly and unexpectedly i always predicted that that's how he'd end stay my dear he suddenly clutched me by the coat and drew me towards him the landlord he whispered brought in some photographs just now horrid photographs of women naked women in various oriental poses and began showing them me in a glass i admired them of course though i did not like them but you know that's just as they brought horrid women to that poor fellow so as to make him drunk more easily why you are talking of von son but that's enough prince the landlord's a fool and nothing more a fool and nothing more c'est mon opinion my dear rescue me from here if you can he suddenly clasped his hands before me prince i will do everything i can i am entirely at your service dear prince wait a little and perhaps i will put everything right 
n'est ce pas we'll cut and run and we'll leave my trunk here to look as though we are coming back where should we run to and what of anna andreevna no no we'll go with anna andreevna oh mon cher there's a regular muddle in my head stay there in my bag on the right is katya's portrait i slipped it in on the sly so that anna andreevna and still more that daria onisimovna should not notice it take it out for goodness sake make haste be careful mind we are not caught couldn't you fasten the door with the hook i did in fact find in the bag a photograph of katerina nikolaevna in an oval frame he took it in his hands carried it to the light and tears suddenly flowed down his thin yellow cheeks. C'est un ange, c'est un ange du ciel, he exclaimed. I never have been as good to her as I ought, and see what's happened now. Cher enfant, I don't believe a word of it, not a word of it. My dear, tell me, can you imagine they are wanting to put me in a madhouse? Je dis des choses charmantes et tout le mori and all of a sudden they take a man like that to a madhouse that's never happened i cried that's a mistake i know her feelings you know her feelings too that's splendid my dear you've given me new life how could they say things against you my dear fetch katya here and let them kiss each other before me and i will take them home and we'll get rid of the landlord he stood up clasped his hands and fell on his knees before me cher he whispered shaking like a leaf in a sort of insane terror my dear tell me the whole truth where will they put me now my god i cried raising him up and making him sit on the bed why you don't believe in me at last do you think that i'm in the plot too i won't let anyone lay a finger on you Sissa, don't let them he faltered clutching me tightly by the elbow with both hands and still trembling don't let anyone touch me don't tell me lies yourself about anything for will they take me away from here listen that landlord ippolit or whatever his name is isn't a doctor a doctor this this isn't a madhouse here in this room but at that instant the door opened and anna andreevna came in she must have been listening at the door and could not resist opening the door too suddenly and the prince who started at every creak shrieked and flung himself on his face on the pillow finally he had something like a fit which ended in sobs see this is your doing i said to her pointing to the old man no it's your doing she raised her voice harshly i appeal to you for the last time arkady makarovitch will you unmask the diabolical intrigue against this defenseless old man and sacrifice your mad and childish dreams of love to save your own sister i will save you all but only in the way i told you this morning i am running off again and perhaps in an hour katerina nikolaevna will be here herself i will reconcile you all and you will all be happy i exclaimed almost with inspiration fetch her fetch her here cried the prince in a flutter take me to her i want to see katya and to bless her he exclaimed lifting up his hands and springing off the bed you see i said to anna andreevna motioning towards him you hear what he says now at all events no document will be any help to you i see but it might help to justify my conduct in the opinion of the world as it is i'm disgraced enough my conscience is clear i am abandoned by every one even by my own brother who has taken fright at my failure but i will do my duty and will remain by this unhappy man to take care of him and be his nurse but there was no time to be lost 
I ran out of the room. I shall come back in an hour, and shall not come back alone, I cried from the doorway. End of Part 3, Chapter 11 Recording by Linda Johnson